Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, work side by side going over the midterm exam one more time, mainly on um, what is to be focused on, what you need to understand, and what are the, these questions are about. For example, the first question on midterm exam is about limit. Okay, it's about limit. And here we have these flashcards on the right hand side. You can see we have limit definition. Okay, in limit definition that we do not require the function is defined at point A. And um, I, I hope you guys understand that, which we emphasize many times, right? But it should be defined in the neighborhood of it. Okay, so let me make this just a little bit larger. Uh, maybe it's too large. Okay, to fit in, right? That's a limit definition. And also we have um, direct substitution. We know that for polynomial rational functions, we can do direct substitution, limit from left and right, which is, which is tested in the first question on um, this first question in uh, midterm exam, right? You can see limit from left, right? You can limit from the left, limit from right, all of these are being tested. And then what else been tested? The next one being tested is how they're related. How is the limit of a function when x approaches a is related? Oh, wait, this is the L, sorry. This should be L, right? How is this related to the limit? How the lim limit, limit from left and limit from right and the limit itself, how they are related. So in this first question of midterm exam, this question, these three, the relationship is being, it's been done over. Once is for limit from left equals the limit from right. Therefore the limit exists. And the other case is that limit from left and limit from right are not the same and therefore the limit does not exist. So you can see the agenda of these questions is to identify, see if you know, you understand and know how to apply these, these theorems, okay? So now let's look at the second question. Let me clear this, okay? The next one, oops. Hold on, let me clear all. The next one is about continuity. It's about continuity. So let's see what we know about continuity, right? Continuous function, right? Continuous function and all of these limit laws we're gonna talk about a little bit later. Um, this one is about Wait, how did I mess this up, right? Um, this is this should be L. This is L, okay. And uh, continuity, there, continuity. So this question is about continuity. So first of all, definition. So this question number two is testing you about the three elements of continuity. First, it's easy, the easiest to check is the function is defined and limit from left and limit from right have to be assessed. And if they're the same, then the limit exists, right? The limit exists. So the uh, left limit, right limit is being tested and for limit. And thirdly, the limit has to equal the function's value at that point. And in this case, of course, it, it does not equal to. The limit does not equal to the function's value at the point zero, therefore is discontinued. Okay, so one of the three conditions for continuity, if one of the conditions is not satisfied, it is discontinuous, okay? <clears throat> Squeeze theorem, squeeze theorem. When we when we apply squeeze theorem, okay. So let's move to 
squeeze theorem. This is squeeze theorem. On squeeze theorem, okay, on squeeze theorem, we need to have a function that, you know, the interested limit is in between, okay? So we need to create a squeeze the situation. We need to create a squeeze the situation. And the squeeze the situation is this. Okay, let me change the color. Uh, red, okay, the, the squeeze the situation. So there's one function below of the interested function, function, which is x squared times sine one over x, and there's one above. So you're gonna show the reader there's a squeeze the situation, also explaining it is true under what circumstances, okay? It is true under what circumstances? So here, let me use a curl, okay? Under the circumstances. Wait, how come it doesn't go? Uh, okay, this one, okay? And once we created this squeeze the situation, and we also need to demonstrate in the theorem that indicates, right? These two limits from the top, the limit of the function below and the limit of the function from up, above, they both exist and equal to the same limit. So you can see if you put the squeeze theorem and what and you work side by side, you can see the conditions are checked. No matter how obvious it is, you want to mention that because you want to quote that theorem and this is how we quote the theorem. Okay, you need to use the necessary words to express yourself. Make it clear for the reader to understand that you understand, all right? Okay, so let's see the next question. The next question is a set of questions that apply limit law, okay? So we get limit law. Sometimes we can apply limit law. Sometimes we cannot apply limit law. See, in the first case, right, we cannot apply limit law. So we apply algebraic law and the definition of limit. In the definition of limit, that when x is approaching three, but x is not three. Because x is not three, so x minus three is not zero. And because x minus three is not a zero, we can apply mathematical principle to reduce it. Okay, I want you guys to get that. Now, once we have reduced the function from this line to the next line, it's a polynomial, so directly. Look at the second question. Second question, we have h approaching zero, right? And h is approaching zero. We obviously cannot plug in, even though it's a rational function because it will cause denominator equal to, equal to zero. So we cannot put, you know, substitute. We cannot do direct substitution. So we use algebraic manipulation by multiply the numerator and denominator by the common denominator x squared, multiply x plus h squared. Reduced, continue to reduce because under this, in this case, right? In this case, we still cannot substitute, right? And the next case we cannot substitute until h is being reduced. The reason we can reduce h is because h is approaching zero, but h is not zero. So it's the same reason when we reduce x minus three in the previous question. So after we reduce h, we no longer have a zero divided by zero situation when, when zero is plugged in, and then we can apply direct substitution, okay? And in this case, the third question in this one is that we apply the, count, the definition. When x is approaching zero from larger than zero, the absolute value of x, right? 
You want, because when x is great, if approaching zero from greater than zero, that means x is larger than zero. If x is positive, the absolute value of a positive is the same as the number. So one over absolute value of x is replaced by one over x. It's a zero. Limit of zero is zero. Now, the next one. Okay. The next one is that we have a situation where x is approaching negative infinity. So, so we have a numerator approaches, you know, something. Oh gosh, I, I should make this a little bit larger. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, when you are looking at this question, you, you can look at the, the front of this question, which is when x is approaching negative infinity. So we have a situation that we cannot plug in, we certainly cannot plug in infinity. So we cannot apply uh, plug in uh, infinity, but we're going to divide both the top and bottom by x raised to the power of three. So the bottom is two over x to the power of three minus one, the top. On the top, you can see we have uh, right here. Okay. So right here, we, we have this situation, right? We want to bring x raised to the power of three inside the square root. So here we use the, because x is approaching negative infinity, so we can assume x is negative. If x is negative, x raised to the power of three is a negative. If x raised to the power of three is a negative, that means the absolute value of x raised to the power of three is gonna be equal to the opposite of x raised to the power of three because x to the power of three is negative, right? And the absolute value of x raised to the power of three is the square root of x raised to the power of three and then squared. So from this relationship, right, from this piece equals to that piece, we got this relationship. So we are going to substitute x raised to the power of three by negative root of x to the power of six. So that's how we get that negative sign, and x is raised to the power of six goes under the um, the square root, and the rest of it will be straightforward. And and here later we apply limit law because every single limit, right after this process, every limit exists in their own right as x approaching negative infinity. So the next step we apply we take limit individually, and then we finalize the question. Okay. So next. The next question is about logarithm. But the property we applied here is, um, I'm gonna find that, okay. I'm gonna find that property here. This is a very commonly used property right here. Okay, right here. If F is continuous at B and, um, and you know, limit, of f of g of x equal f of b, then we can bring the limit inside. Okay, so if f is continuous at b and this is true, right? So we have two conditions here, and this is the conclusion. This is the conclusion. So under what circumstances we can bring the limit across x? Well, that condition is number one inside f of the g position it has a limit. Secondly, F has to be continuous. F has to be continuous. So in our situation, okay, so in our situation, what we have is ln is a continuous function. It's a continuous everywhere in its domain. So after we apply the quotient rule, right, we apply a quotient rule here, right? We apply the quotient rule here, 
then uh, let me write down the quotient rule in case some of you need uh, some. Uh, so Ellen, right? Uh, parenthesis something divided A divided by B is equal to Ellen A subtracting Ellen B, right? A divided by B. So logarithm, natural logarithm A divided by B is Ellen A minus Ellen B. So we apply this quotient rule from right to left, all right? So once we get that, we still cannot plug in, right? And so we divide x in both numerator and denominator in, in inside this expression. So that's how we get this part, right? Mathematical principle. And by this time, we see that ln function is a continuous function, okay? And inside the limit, it limit exists, okay? Inside the limit exists. Actually, I should put a parenthesis here, okay? Limit exists, but without the limit is okay too, actually, okay? And uh, as x approaching infinity, we get two over x, that's gonna be zero. The limit as x approaching infinity, one over x. You know what? Actually, we don't need that. We don't need this parenthesis. Okay, we don't need this parenthesis because the limit of one is one. Okay, to keep it as it as it is. No need for the for that because the all the all the individual limit, right? All the individual limit. All the individual limit, right? This one. Limit, this the individual limit, they all exist. So the limit of this big quotient, this limit exists. All right. So um, so we got that. So we we actually applied this property to the right in your flow chart. It's very important to understand this. Okay, because this question is testing you about this theorem. It's testing us about this theorem, okay? So let's look at the next question. Intermediate value theorem. Intermediate value theorem, okay? Intermediate value theorem is here, right? And we're using its corollary. We're using its corollary, okay? We're using its corollary, which is um, we're gonna, in this case, we have to create a function when that function is not given explicitly. So first thing we do is create that function. We are given an equation. That's an if statement, right? So in this equation, okay, in this equation, right, we can, discover what function we should introduce. We mainly, the idea is making zero. So you, you either subtract cosine x on both sides or subtract x to power three on both sides. So you want to define this function first. This should be done properly. And then you're going to speak about this function. This function is a continuous, continuous on the entire number line. But you also have to mention that this function is continuous on the closed interval because that is a condition in the theorem. When we apply that theorem, we have to mention that this function is continuous on the closed interval. And the second condition we're checking, right? We, so we decide that we're going to use this interval. You can experiment, right? Which interval is going to work, right? You can just ex experiment that on scratch paper. So we found zero to pi would make it. So you mainly want to get f of a multiplied f of b is less than zero. So our a here in this question is zero, b is pi. So this piece is just to tell the reader the second condition is satisfied. You can see we do that in that order in the narrative of the state uh, of the theorem. And then we quote the theorem by mean value, by intermediate value theorem, there exists at least one real root uh, C between zero and pi, such that f of C is zero. 
And what is f of t? f of t will be translated, okay, to f of t right here. You basically plug in t in the function we defined earlier, and then adding cosine c on both sides, which this piece is going to match the one we had at the beginning, the original equation. So we have such a number to make that equation true. Therefore, it says we have a root. So this is how we apply theorem, which is you're gonna check every condition mentioned, no matter how obvious you have to mention that because you want to use those most obvious facts to make your case, to make our case. Okay, all right, so next. Next is about the uh, application of differentiability. There are lots of flashcards in between. I'm, I'm not going over one by one at a time. They're all pretty useful. So be, be mindful of using these, um, you know, these tools because all of these are tools, right? These are tools for us to to um, you know, to serve our purpose to make our case. Okay. Uh, definition of derivative. Definition of derivative. So this is the definition we use. We know that we have two versions at least about derivative. In this question, in this question, right? We don't. We want to find out whether the function is differentiable at a specific point. At a specific point. So the most direct, the most direct way to do it is we're going to apply definition because we cannot apply uh, any other theorems, right? Because it's piecewise function. We have theorems to say um, polynomial, uh, rational functions, uh, exponential functions, logarithm functions, sine functions, trig functions. They are all differentiable, but this one is neither. This one is a piecewise function. So to make our case that is a differentiable at a specific point or not a differentiable at a specific uh, at a specific point, our one of our best tools in many cases is to apply definition. Okay, so we apply definition, right? F of zero plus h because the interested number, the interested point is zero. Okay, so the interested point is zero. We apply one a equals zero, so a equals zero, right? A equals zero. And then we ended up with something like this. So we need to determine whether this limit exists or not, right? If it doesn't exist, then it is not a differentiable as zero. If it is, if it does exist, and what it is, right? So the fact we use here is that sine of anything is less than, the absolute value is less than or equal to, uh, equals to one. And of course, considering domain, h cannot be zero, right? So then what we did is that we multiply h, right? Well, we, we started with this fact, and then we multiply h on both sides, right? So this is less than or equals to one times h, less than or equals to h. And now, so this expression, h to times sine one over h is greater than or equals to negative absolute value of h and smaller than the absolute value of h. And this is a, a squeeze the situation. So we are, uh, we are applying squeeze theorem. So we created a squeeze situation. Okay, so let me bring back our squeeze theorem. Our squeeze theorem right here. So we have a squeeze the situation. And the function from bottom, the function from the top, they have the same limit. Therefore, the limit exists. Not only the limit exists, it's a zero. And therefore, we say f of x is differentiable at zero. So you can see in this question, we have used the definition of differentiability, and we also have used squeeze theorem to make our case, to make our case, all right? Okay.
Next. Definition of, of uh, apply definition of a derivative. Okay, so we're going to, uh, this is the to apply definition of a derivative. So to get a derivative as a function, to get a derivative as a function. So basically we apply this definition. Um, it's pretty straightforward, except that it requires some algebraic patience. Okay, we need to be patient. And also, we use definition to find the derivative of the function at a point. And we use the derivative at this point, which is the slope of the tangent line passes that specific point, which is 2 comma 3, right? And we have, we also created a tangent line equation, okay? Tangent line equation. So that was pretty straightforward. Uh, the next question, question number eight, actually, we have five questions here, and these are more conceptual. These are more conceptual, okay? These, these questions, it's talking about the relationship between limit, continuity, and the differentiability. Each is stronger than the previous, okay? In other words, Uh, let me write it down on this side. Limit at A, right? Continuity at A. Point wise, right? And the third one, the third one is differentiability at A. How are these two are related? Or how are these three related? Okay, so we're gonna um we're gonna speak of those. Okay. From the definition, from the definition, continuity, one of the conditions in continuity, one of the, the three conditions for a function continuous at A. The first one defined at A, second one is, um, you know, limit exists at A, and thirdly, the, the, the limit has to be equal to the, the defined value of the function at A. So in the definition of continuity itself, it included, okay? It included, oops, never mind. That should not be there. It should be reversed. How come they don't have the other direction, huh? Okay, I would just have to go, I'm going to have to make that arrow myself um, here, okay? so. Continuity will guarantee limit, okay? And this theorem, this theorem right here, okay? Theorem, if f is differentiable at a, f is continuous at a. So if the fun function is differentiable at a, then it is continuous, okay? Now, how about the reversal of these three? For example, in the reversal, no guarantee. And in particular, limit at A does not guarantee continuity at A. And continuity at A does not guarantee differentiability at A. And we have counterexamples. Okay, in this case, the counterexample is f of x equals to absolute value of x. That's the simplest example to illustrate that this function is continuous at, at zero, but is not differentiable at zero. We have studied that in class, but the arrow the, in the red direction is true. So you, if you look at these five questions, right? If, if the limit exists, then it is continuous. Then that is not true. How do we know that? How do we know that? We have plenty of examples, right? Um, for example, just on this 
particular exam, right? I'm going to close this down, right? Limit exists, but it's not continuous. Limit exists, but it's not continuous. Didn't we do a question number two, right? Limit exists, limit exists, but it's not continuous, right? Ex question number two itself is an example to say that limit exists, but it's not a continuous, all right? So and there, there are also very many other examples you can find out. Second question, if F is not continuous at A, then it is not a differentiable. And this is the reversal of the theorem number four, this theorem, right? Because in this theorem, it says, okay, in this theorem, it says, right, if A, then B, right? A, of course, is differentiable, B is in this continuous, right? Now, if this is true, this is zero, then, this theorem, the other way to say this theorem is if not B, then not A. So the statement B is saying exactly that, that if it's not a continuous, for sure, it is not a differentiable. C, if F is a differentiable at A, then it is continuous. Yes, the theorem guarantees that, right? It's Differentiable a, at A, then it's continuous at A. Very good. So C is true. E, if F is continuous at A, then limit exists. And that was in the definition of the definition of continuity. Okay? So D is true. E. Okay? E is saying that if it's differentiable, then limit exists. And this is talking about the relationship between between um, between differentiability and the limit, right? So if differentiable, then it's continuous. And if continuous, then limit exists. So the larger picture is, if it is differentiable, then it is surely has limit at A, right? So from differentiability, we get limit. So the E is also true, okay? So that's the question we just discussed. All right, let's look at the next one. This one is to use the definition to find the derivative of a function. And this function is, you know, square root of uh, nine minus X. And the, we went through rationalization, applying, you know, rationalization, simplifying, and then apply direct substitution when uh, the rule of direct substitution applies. Okay, so I'm going to leave that, uh, leave that right there. And by the by the time we had the midterm exam, we just learned the product rule and the quotient rule. So these these two questions we have done on the midterm exam, now it should be pretty easy for you. Um, so that's all for this. Thank you for watching. Have a nice day.